Welcome everybody to this episode of Herd Mates. And today I'm very pleased to have Vinny Tortorich joining us. Um, Vinny is also known as the celebrity fitness trainer. He's speaker, podcaster, best-selling author of Fitness Confidential. And now we can add documentary producer to his list of credits with Fat, a documentary, which that was released in 2019, right? Yeah, it, it was. And believe it or not, I, I don't know when this podcast is going to go up, but we made a deal and the new movie, Fat, a documentary too, is coming out in January, 2021. So in just a couple of months, we have uh, part two coming out. Excellent. Excellent. So people... We'll be listening to this before then, but they can add that to their list of, of must-see for the beginning of the year. So why do some people call you America's angriest trainer? Um, that came from, uh, <laughs> you know, when we started the podcast, it was back, it was like nine years ago, and we didn't even know what a podcast really was. And I thought I was going to do a half a dozen of these. I didn't even know what I was doing. And um we said we had to have some kind of tagline and I wanted to call myself America's trainer. And somehow we Googled that and it was taken somehow. And so Serena goes, you know, you're really angry about what's going on in the world of health and fitness and diet. So how about we just call you America's angriest trainer? And, and we Googled that and no one had taken it. Perfect. So we didn't think of the kind of real negative connotation, Peter, because when, when, when I got popular on the internet, I started getting invited onto national television shows and what have you. And the first question out of every host or co-host's mouth was, hey, I was talking to you backstage. You don't seem so angry. And they would spend five of my seven minutes explaining that I wasn't actually angry and I was like, yeah, I got to kind of walk that one back to the house and <laughs> come out with something else, you know? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So again, just before we got started, you were, we were talking about how long you've been uh, in this community uh, or maybe even multiple communities. Um, now you received an undergraduate in exercise physiology, LSU, yeah, well, correct? Uh, yeah, and I also have an undergrad in uh, secondary education, which makes me a very, very overqualified PE teacher. Excellent. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> a better sense of humor than most of the ones I had, though, I have to tell you. Yeah, oh, yeah. And look, I thought about that. I was like, am I going to just wear spandex shorts with pockets for the rest of my life? It just didn't seem like a, a job for me. But I, I didn't know. Look, I went to school on a football scholarship and, you know, I was like, wow, now what do I do? And my parents were school teachers. So I went down that alley, but I had this, this interest in biology and, uh, and of course exercise because I walked into a gym when I was a little kid and, you know, they had all these classes and, you know, physiology of exercise and exercise science. And, you know, I just started going down that road and, for the first time in my life, Peter, education was fun. You know, when you're in grade school, you know, you have to learn geography. And I'm glad that I understand geography and you have to learn history. And I'm really glad I understand history. And luckily, I learned some English because I wrote two books, but I sucked at English and math. So, but when you get to college, you get to do exactly what you want to do. You know, you don't have to mess around with all the other stuff, really. You have to do some math and some English. You have to, you know, play that game. But, you know, you can really start delving into what you want. You know, I mean, how did you become an agronomer? You know, it was something that you were interested in at some point, right? And you get to just dive in. Right. right. Yeah, I completely agree. You find something that becomes clear that your passion is in that area and you if you're lucky, then there's, there's some clear path and otherwise you have to clear the path. And, um, yeah. um, but you, I mean, you started in this in 1980. So what was the landscape of diet and health and exercise advice in 1980 for those many people that have no memory of that time? 
Well, it actually started before college because I, I, I walked into a gym in 1970 and uh, I was eight years old. And I only walked into a gym because a family friend had a, a gym in his garage. And I was infinitely fascinated. His name was Joe Bonadonna. Um, I was fascinated with this guy's size and his arms. He looked like a real life cartoon character. You know, it's like, oh my God, this is, this is like Superman in the flesh, right? And I understood very young that if you lift heavy things over your head, that this will happen to you. And I just went there every day after school because I was kind of this kid that I didn't have many friends. I was being goofed on. I had a really bad speech impediment. So it was safe to go hang out with this guy, right? And he was a family friend and my parents knew who he was. And, uh, you know, so by the time I was 11 or 12, I was such a physical kid. I, I looked more physical beyond my years because I had been messing, Joe would let me do pull-ups and push-ups and then he would let me work with the bars and he brought me along slowly. And I did, I started doing really well in sports and other people, it's a small football community down south in Louisiana. People started seeing this and they wanted their kid to start doing the same thing. And now Joe has a problem because he's only got this garage. And, you know, out of the mouth of babes, I kept saying, Joe, why don't we get a place that's bigger than this? You know, and I was thinking like my uncle's born. You know, I grew up in a in an agricultural family where everyone had sugar cane, believe it or not. And my thing was, let's move it to my uncle's barn and then everybody can come. And Joe started thinking about that and messing around, talking to a few people. He rented uh, the building from the St. Joe Society, an Italian group of Catholics in, in my hometown. And he moved his weights and bought more weights and started Jim's Jim, Jim's health, uh, Joe's uh, health club, I'm sorry. I was his only employee and I didn't get paid. What I got was a key to the gym. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only reason I had a key was because I would go before school and open it because Joe also drove a school bus. And um, after school, I would go back to Joe's and I would instruct people. I was probably 15 or 16 at the time. I would instruct people who were in their 20s, 30s, 40s. I learned how to talk to adults and, and convey messages and convey information to them that they needed, right? So it was kind of a natural shoe-in by the time I got to college. Besides being on the football team, I got a part-time job working. I got credit for it. They didn't give me money for it. The university made me the assistant strength trainer. Basically, my job was to go around and wipe down the machines and make sure they were well oiled and put some graphite on them or what have you. But um, since Tulane was a private school, a lot of the alumni would come in and these were people with money and um, they would, I would show them how to use the machines because it was my job to, to show them what to do, not to get hurt. And um, they would tip me and I was very appreciative of the tips. It, did I know that that was going to be 40 years down the road, I would be doing the same thing? Absolutely not. Right. I was just looking for tip money. But that was the beginning of that, mm -hmm. that, that, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. you know? So at, at some point then, it morphs a little bit from the strength work, or maybe it doesn't. You can respond to that idea. But it, it then the weight loss aspect comes in. So did that happen once you moved to Southern California or how no, did that it happen? It happened in New Orleans because uh, even after college, I stayed there um, um, for another six years and I remained the assistant at Tulane until I got hired by a really swanky private school called Newman Isidore Newman School. That's where, you know, Archie Manning's kids went to school. So I had the pleasure of coaching two of them, Cooper and, and uh, Peyton, uh, in the weight room. And, and other kids that went on to do great things. Um, but I was the head coach there. Um, my, I, I, look, I just assumed I would be a head coach in weightlifting somewhere. So I, to answer your question, I was still into strength training. And you have to remember, Peter, um, we're, we're around the same age. I'm a few years younger than you. 
women who came to me at Tulane and then the parents, the women who came to me at Newman School, these uptown New Orleans women, you know, oil money and what have you, they weren't particularly looking to lose weight because no one was fat yet. Mm. They were toning up. They felt like they were losing their youth. They, they would come in and say to me, my butt's getting flat. You know, I would hear that kind of thing. Or look at these bingo arms. You know, th that's the kind of things I would hear. It wasn't, hey, I've gained 40 or 50 pounds. That wasn't going on back then. Mm -hmm. um, the, it, it eventually became that. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about it back then because the one thing I did see at Isidore Newman School was the kids seemed to be more robust. You know, I, I saw shades of fat coming onto kids mm -hmm. that I didn't see just a few years earlier when I was in high school. And that made no sense to me. And the impetus, the reason to even think about moving to LA was to get on camera or at least create television shows to talk about childhood obesity because I was looking at this in 1987 and 1988. 1989, and I'm thinking, this is not going away. It just seems to be getting worse, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was also incidentally the time when I started seeing things like snack wells and people saying things like, if you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading a book by a guy named Robert Haas called Eat to Win, where the whole book was just eat pasta and bread and rice and beans and you will look like Martina Navratilova. I'm not kidding, that's in the book. Um, and it, I, I was sitting there going, oh, wait a minute. My Italian grandmother who had a fifth grade education understood if you ate bread and pasta, you will get fat. Mm. How is this now the way you lose weight? Mm -hmm. When you have peasant grandparents from the old country that knew that that was not the right way. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's that started my looking into that. Okay, so what? How long back does no sugar, no grain go? NSNG. It started uh, back in the New Orleans days. Um, I, I used to refer to it as, as um, and this is a word we should start using again. Um, uh, Atkins. I would say, look, I'm going to put you guys on something close to an Atkins diet. They didn't like it because they all thought they were going to die of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any evidence otherwise, except to say thin, good-looking people don't die of heart attacks. I, I didn't have any, you know, but I didn't, I, I didn't have the knowledge back then. I didn't mm -hmm. have what I needed, mm -hmm. right? It was like, you know, but everyone was talking about, what about this cholesterol? Cholesterol, they started talking about that. Before that, Peter, as you know, no one knew what their cholesterol number was. Mm -hmm. No one talked about yeah. cholesterol. M many still don't. They just say it's high. When you ask them, what does right. that mean? They don't know, but. <laughs> right. Everybody wants to get their cholesterol down and we need that. That's a building block. That's a hormone we need in our body. We need that fat. Mm -hmm. uh, we need that, that cholesterol to live. It's essential to health. And if we don't take it, our bodies will make it. And mm -hmm. it, it it baffles me that doctors don't understand that. Mm. But I didn't have much to go on back then. You know, it, it took me years to come around to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if I could just skip ahead a bit, when I got to California and, you know, actresses and actors, they only care about looking a certain way. And they would say to me, well, I, I'll go along with you for a while because at least I'll look the way I want to look. Uh, and then we can worry about my heart later. You know, they mm. have that approach too. But mm -hmm. it was a little different in LA. Right. So no sugar, no grain. Okay. So tell P and as you mentioned, Atkins is a name that should be rehabilitated. But yeah. um, you know, I remember I think Mike Ede saying that one of the reasons they called their books protein power was because it was the the depths or the height, depending on how you want to look at it, of the lipophobia age where fat was going to kill you if you just looked at it. Um, and like you said, if you don't eat fat, you can't get fat. And 
you know, we'll pour, we'll pour bacon grease down the drain and, oh, look, it solidifies. Imagine what it's doing in your arteries. So that may be a segue. <laughs> uh, we'll just jump out of the narrative and go to uh, FATA documentary. Why did you make that? What sorts of information would somebody get by watching that? And now I'm really excited about the, the you know, part two. Yeah, you know, I did not want to do it, period. Um, people, people, you know, around me kept coming to me saying, first off, it was start every time something like Cowspiracy would come out or um, all of them, um, uh, all of the not, vegan propaganda. Yeah, Forks Over Knives. and Yeah, Forks Over Knives, What the Health. And yep. these movies would come out, and you've seen them as well as, as I have, and it's just propaganda films. And I, I, I only get mad at those movies. I'm not mad at vegans. I'm mad at the people who make those movies and lie to vegans. Because, you know, as I say at the beginning of every one of my podcasts, you know, um, your good intentions have been stolen. I'm just trying to help you get them back. Mm -hmm. And I really do mean that. And when I watch these movies, I would go, okay, any sane person would think that this is the way to go because you've just been lied to again by these people who know they're lying to you. That's, mm -hmm. that's the crazy part. And so when these movies would come out, people would say, Vinny, you need to do the opposite movie. And I would go, okay, why me? And they would say, because you're in Hollywood. I went, that's like saying I live in Cape Canaveral. I, I could go fly yeah. a space shuttle, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It, you know, <laughs> it made no sense to me. It's like, but yeah, but you know people in Hollywood. You, mm -hmm. You're, and I, and I get the sentiment. I was tied into the Hollywood community, so everyone thought that that's why you should do it. And you know, I always thought that you know, I would, I would kind of daydream, you know, and I would go, well, if I did a movie, would I do a propaganda movie in the opposite direction, or would I just? lay the facts out. And since I was so mad at the other side, I said, okay, I would just put the facts out there and then you can decide on your own, um, which is what I think I did. Uh, hopefully I did that. Um, but the way it came about was when Peter, when Peter Pardini came to me and said, you should do this movie. And he was just coming off of this big documentary he had done for the band Chicago called uh, Now More Than Ever. I was like, Peter, you too? And he was like, yeah, man, look, I, I heard you on Adam Carolla's show. I lost all this weight. I'm a big believer. I've been Googling everything. He would Google people like you and Nina Teichos and Gary Taubes and all the, you know, the, the kind of the sentinels who are up there and doing this incredible work. And he's like, why don't you, why don't you just do it? And I said, Peter, everyone tells me this is going to cost a lot of money. And he goes, all you have to do is get 150,000. He goes, I will do it. We can make this for 150,000, mm. which was a lie. Mm. Um, <laughs> and he, he, we got together and he says, we'll crowdfund it. And, and the only reason I said okay to it was I was absolutely certain that nobody would give me $150,000. Um, but we got a quarter of a million dollars instead. Um, people gave us way more money than we thought we would get. Um, I had to put some of my own money into it to finish it. You know, we were at, we were at the 20 yard line. We had to punch it over. We had to score. And, uh, I was like, okay, I'll probably never see this money again, but it was a passion project. And mm -hmm. I put my own cash into it. And, uh, I told Serena, I said, just, let's just wave goodbye to it. Never think that this money's coming back. I never want to hear I told you so. I never want, it's gone, right? So we put the money into it. We finished it. I think the movie came out really well. You might have other ideas about it. Um, it went to number one on iTunes. It went to number one on um, uh, uh, Amazon. They put it on Amazon Prime. It, can, it stayed up there forever. In the right category? Say again? In the right category? It finally in the right category. It, it, and, you know, when it was in the wrong category, it was beating out films. It would make it like to number six or number seven in action and adventure. You know, it's like, it, it was like, do, yeah. So finally they put it in the right category. And I'm like, 
And we kept calling him going, listen, guys, the word documentary is in the title. Why is it in rom-coms now? You know, and they just kept doing that. You know, I think someone there was trying to see it not do well. And at some point, clear heads prevailed and they put it in documentaries and, and then they it did so well, they put it on Amazon Prime. And it, the crazy thing is, is that the world was ready for the truth, you know? And the beauty of it is, was that we overshot everything. Like if I had had you in the seat, right? Mm -hmm. I would have asked you all the questions for this movie and I, I would have asked you an extra 10 or 12 questions. And a lot of people were sitting there going, why is he asking me about that? What they didn't realize was I was overshooting everything because I knew if the movie did become a thing, I would do a second movie mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have to go reshoot it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was already right. shot. Right. So right. That, that's why we did that. And um, it, oh, by the way, it gravitas the people that put it out. I'm going to brag on it just once more. It became the number one documentary they've ever put out. And they, they put out the one on, you know, that guy that was juicing across the country. He was like this Australian guy. Mm. And he was like, he, I'm going to go across the country and I'm going to juice. So just drink juice. It's like, it made no sense. Yeah. But that was like a big deal <laughs> for them. <laughs> this beat all of that. It beat every, Good. everything Congratulations. else. And uh, so when the second one came out, I called Brendan Gallagher and I said, I, I think I'm going to just put this one out by myself. I'm not sure it's worthy of you guys. And and uh, he goes, can we just take a look at it? And sure, I sent him the, the link. And he called me back three hours later. And the movie is 90 minutes long. And I'm like, really? You watched it already? And he was like, we have to have this movie. Mm -hmm. We'll do whatever it takes to get this movie. Who else are you talking to? And I was like, no. I was just going to put it out myself as a supplement. He goes, you don't understand. This is better than your first movie. And your first oh, movie wow. is the best one we've ever done. So Congratulations. I hope the audience sees it the same way, Peter. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I can't be objective about the movie. Yeah, yeah. It. right. It's uh, one of my lines is show me um, a man uh, without a point of view and I'll show you a corpse. Right. I mean, we, we all have that. And as long as we acknowledge it and, you know, just be honest about it, I think we'll be fine. Um, so watching this uh, documentary, just sort of brief overview, somebody who, see, I, I see myself as someone standing between the community that you've been a part of for 40 years, the low carb, keto, carnivore, call it whatever, you know, metabolic health and nutrition community and the agricultural community. And there's some others, but those are the two primary ones. And I want to introduce us to each other because I think we've got a lot to learn from each other. So it, some of this stuff, um, well, I, I know I've given talks on topics and then it's like, I want to talk about something new because I've talked about that a lot. And, right. and the organizer comes up afterwards and says, now I want you to talk about this before you're done. It's like, I've talked about that, um, yeah. but I get it. Not everybody is as familiar or immersed, but as we think about breaking out of our bubbles and trying to introduce people to each other, this story of how saturated fat from animal source foods, although that's not the only source of saturated fat in the human diet, but primarily came to be considered a health risk. And, and just sort of the broad sweep of that and what you're trying to introduce people to in your documentary. Z yeah, you know, we, we were originally going to go back to Ansel Keys because everyone can go back to, you know, Ansel Keys and go, well, this guy was a bully and he came along and he, he said this and he did it right at the right time because the president in 1957 had a heart attack. And so everyone kind of takes off right there. But the groundwork had, they, they started laying the groundwork just by happenstance with uh, the Seventh-day Adventists back in the late 1860s um, with Ellen G. White. 
Um, no, she wasn't a scientist. She wasn't a doctor. She wasn't anything. She was just a crazy person. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I say that with all due respect to Ellen G. White. She was just an insane human being. Um, it, it, one might say that she suffered a traumatic brain injury as a child during an era of poor care. And then whatever happened afterwards, you can sort of look at within that kind of a lens. I'll put it to you this way. You know, today, you know, it, if, you, if someone today said, you know, and I'll, I'll use a real example, uh, David Koresh, the Branch Divinians. I talk to God, I see God, me and God, we're like this, we're good friends. We go, okay, that's a crazy, that's a crazy guy, and he's the head of a cult, mm -hmm. right? In 1860, Ellen G. White said, I spoke to God last night, and instead of anyone saying, oh, she's a crazy woman, they went, oh, really? What did God have to say? Mm -hmm. In what world is that normal, right? Mm -hmm. Now we call those people crazy. We see flat earthers, you know, we go, well, that's just insane people, right? We don't go, really, you think the world's flat? Well, let's study that. Mm -hmm. Well, hell, we, we got over that back in, what, 1492, mm -hmm. when Columbus sailed the ocean blue? I mean, <laughs> yeah. did anyone probably miss some that? evidence? Probably some evidence a little before that. And right. clearly, so clearly for people who live a life of faith, the idea of praying and meditating and feeling a sense of guidance right. isn't to be disregarded. The, the claims of others, ultimately you test them. Um, you know, we see what happens. And there's a lot of evidence here to suggest that whatever she was receiving probably wasn't um, the guidance that she maybe thought it was or represented it as being. Right. And, and you know, and, and you're right. I, I don't mean to look at any religion or spirituality or higher being as anything. You, you know, it, that is what it is. But when someone within those groups steps out and says, God came to me specifically and he told me to tell you that we can't eat anything with a face. He didn't tell me. <laughs> right. It's like, well, why did God tell you in your sleep? I was available. <laughs> yeah. I, was, uh, I, was, I was awake. God could have come to yeah. me. I was awake. You know, so there lies the beginning of the problem, you know, and then the story gets muddled because the Seventh-day Adventist church didn't believe in masturbation or really even procreation. I don't know how they claim, you know, you know, keeping the species growing, but, um, and they figured out that when you didn't eat meat, you weren't as virile. So if you stopped eating red meat, young men, you won't masturbate and- Or, or carnal, right? I mean, the word itself. Right, exactly. Which, which is crazy. It, it, the whole idea is crazy and it all gets muddled between Ellen having a, a chat with God and don't eat anything with the face and, and masturbation. And then Kellogg's coming along. He was in the church, uh, John Kellogg. And he figured out dextrinization and said, hey, I have, a, I have a little chip here. If you eat this, you won't be as horny. So get away from meat, start eating this. Mm -hmm. So we started laying the seed work for this in the early days of veganism. Mm -hmm. Back, by the way, as you know, Peter, before veganism could actually be a reality because we didn't have exogenous vitamins. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we didn't even start discovering the first vitamins until 19, I wrote it in my book and I should remember what I wrote. I want to say 1920s, 1930s, uh, Greta, Gretna, something, a, a, a German scientist, a female, mm -hmm. figured it out. And then we went to World War II and all of that kind of got dropped and we picked it up again. But once we had exogenous vitamins, now the vegans can go, hey, get your B vitamins here. As a matter of fact, we'll spray it onto your cereal, which is what they do. Yeah. Eight essential vitamins and irons, folks. You ever hear of that? Eight essential. There's 13 essential vitamins. Mm -hmm. Who played Sophie's Choice with vitamins in your cereal? Well, mm -hmm. they only put the ones you can't get 
anywhere else except in meat, the B vitamins. Well, you can get most of them, but you can't get B12. Well, but so, even cereal, I mean, if you were eating it with whole fat milk, at least you'd have a shot. But, you know, if you're going to say no animal source food at all, right. now you're up against just biology, that there are nutrients that are not sourced at all from plant source foods, or they're poorly sourced for many others. Um, and then there's all kinds of other issues that people have sensitivities to. So I was quite strike stricken. <laughs> I was quite struck by your point that you made there when I had heard it a little while ago watching some YouTube that this, so people think of people who live in the nation of India as vegetarians. Right. And I kind of like to restore the, the respectability of the word omnivore because they're omnivores. They're just, they right. don't eat beef. There, there may be some other animal source foods that they don't eat, but they do eat animal source foods. And, and talking to a protein nutritionist recently, and he told me that an eight-year-old boy, for example, growing up in India, who might try uh, have unlimited access to a rice and lentil diet, physically couldn't eat enough to get the, the digestible, indispensable amino acids that he needs to develop properly. So this, this idea, we do a lot of that, it seems, in the uh, affluent, you know, high-income countries. We, we imagine things that when you get out into the real world just aren't so. And the problem is that we cause harm to people. Um, as well as if we're placed so that we can actually affect policy, then we can do great damage. And so I think that um, one thing that we can say, and, and I think others also would echo the, the point that this all didn't start in 77 with the dietary goals released by McGovern, as you say, the, the, the train had been rolling for a while. In fact, the people that wrote it were riding that train. Um, so it, it didn't come out of nowhere when they created those guidelines for the first time. Well, whatever guidance we had been getting was talking about making sure that you get meat every day or dairy or eggs. And somehow that all transitioned between World War I and than the 70s. Well, let, let's talk about the McGovern Commission just a little bit. Um, McGovern um, was um, a, a Democrat and that doesn't matter here politically other than the fact that uh, they were trying to figure out, the Democrats at the time figured, hey, we could get more poor black votes in the South if we give them something else. They, they were looking for something to, to give, right? Mm -hmm. And they found that these people were starving. And I thought it started off as a good thing that they wanted oh. to um, create food stamps. Undernutrition, right? That... Uh, uh, yeah, right. But the, so the whole idea was, hey, let, let's, let's give them food stamps and then we can feed these people and they'll vote for us. And it was a, a terrific plan and I'm all for it. You know, feeding poor people in this country, mm -hmm. I'm all in. Right. Yeah. And in fairness, we should point out, you know, whites in Appalachia, we should point out lots of indigent oh, it, it people. Doesn't, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It doesn't matter. If you were yeah. poor, they were looking to get your vote. Sure. Uh, uh, it was part of the Great Society program, right? Um, but they did go down to Mississippi and that's what they did. They, they started, it all started in Mississippi of mm -hmm. all places. And, and so they said, okay, well, we need to start studying this so that we can figure out a way to create these food stamps. Right. So they started studying it and studying it and studying. And the McGovern Commission went on for 10 years. And that's something I talked about in the movie. And most people don't know that. It goes on for 10 years. And at the beginning, it was to study hunger in America. And at some point, again, our hero, Ansel Keys, who started his, his campaign back in the late 1950s, he's a bully. And he just keeps riding that wave. And now we're looking at the end, uh, 1977, we're looking at 10 years of the McGovern Commission. And uh, he, Ansel Keys weaved his way in there and it no longer was about feeding poor people. 
it was about <laughs> changing the way we ate, right? Yeah, and overnutrition, it, right? Overnutrition, exactly. And, you know, at the end of the commission, I show it in my movie, they literally say, they throw their hands up and go, okay, we're going to pick one. And they, they went with, ah, let's eat less meat, more grains, committee adjourned. And there was one guy who stood up and said, I don't think we should do this. This is not right. We, we can't just throw this out there. And they were like, we're good. We're all going fishing. Mm -hmm. We're out of here. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, even to the point where, and I, I, again, one of the reasons that I want to do this and continue to be active is because I think the scientists in the disciplines that I'm familiar with, as we get trained more and more, you know, our, our, our knowledge gets a mile deep and, you know, a couple inches wide kind of thing. You know, we get a lot of expertise, but now we're getting separated from each other. Our silos have these big gaps between them. Right. So I hope to build bridges, but also a lot of people are essentially taught to stay in their lane and they're taught how to talk about their research findings, right? And so they came up against people that didn't operate that way in the 70s. Yeah. And so you had people who were, by my memory, they were, they were testifying saying, you know, we have this evidence that suggests that there might be harm, right? We're, we're seeing this, we can't be sure, but we have, re and, and, and the people that were on the other side managed to convince themselves that they could disregard that. And in fact, they could imagine no harm coming from their recommendations. They essentially said as much in, in their written document coming out that, you know, we, that there is this controversy, but we can't imagine that it would hurt anything. So we might as well do it. Well, you know, there were people trying to warn them. They just paid no attention. I had an emeritus professor. So this would be now in the early eighties and he was a nutrition professor and he was trying to warn us <laughs> about what was going on and how ludicrous it was that what was being talked about. And, and I remember us just kind of going, oh, he should have retired completely. He's just, you know, so maybe part of what I'm doing is amends to his memory that, um, yeah, they knew more. Um, and, and so we, we, we entered into this new realm. It was heavily influenced by nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. There was really no hard, high quality evidence from any kind of a study that would have supported what they were saying. And so I've, I've had a couple guests now who have introduced the audience to the problems with nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease. It's the softest of the soft sciences, as people say, certainly low grade evidence. It, it should not be the basis of, of policy. And then we, we had that being released where all of a sudden we were supposed to limit total fat, limit saturated fat. Egg producers were told that they needed to breed chickens that would lay low cholesterol eggs. Um, it had effects on all of agriculture to do this. Um, but it doesn't seem like the promise, it, it seems fair to say that Americans responded to the dietary gu guidance, but that the promised results didn't come. And that may be an understatement. <laughs> no, no, it is an understatement because, um, you know, especially when we did the pyramid and then we, we, we then we went with the my plate and then we did the pyramid again and, you know, we're doing all this stuff and, and everyone's going, I'm doing exactly what they're telling me. It's not working. So I'm going to double down on what's not working. So yeah, America listened loud and clear. Uh, a point I want to make, and I'm sure if you haven't had them on your show yet, I'm sure they're coming on within weeks. Um, Gary Taubes and Nina Teichels do, and Nina even more than Gary, um, does an incredible job. And, and folks, if you haven't read this book, go get her book, um, Big Fat Surprise. Nina does an amazing job at looking at the same studies that got us into this mess to show you to your point, 
you know, people go, well, you know, wait, we're saying this, but it, eh, I don't know. You could take the same exact studies and extrapolate the opposite answer from the same studies. As a matter of fact, you don't have to squint when you pull the opposite answer out. You know, when you get take the answer we did go with, you got to do a lot of squinting just to get there. Well, in fact, some people have managed to obtain some of the data from some of those studies and do a reanalysis of it. And this has been published within certainly the last five years. I may be off, but, and basically what they showed was, no, in fact, their conclusions from way back when were substantiated by their data. And uh, Gary Taubes as well, uh, I certainly have, uh, one of my patterns, I go to these conferences and if I'm driving, I find out where the bookstore is so I can stop on the way to see if I can pick up a copy of The Big Fat Surprise, Why Butter, Meat and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet, or um, The Case Against Sugar or Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. Um, not everyone's up to reading Good Calories, Bad Calories, those last three are Gary's books. And I'm very much looking forward to The Case for Keto, which I think should be coming out yeah. next month now. Um, but those are books that I certainly recommend. Um, and yeah, the, this, how we, um, uh, one, of, one of the graphics that I've leveraged from Adele Height is, you know, imagine a, a crystal goblet with water in it and somebody dribbling a stream of oil into it so it's yellow. So you can see the little globules and, and the line across it is that policy unequal to science, right? The two are not the same, but we treat them as if they are. And, and I also, I, I, I think a lot of people in animal agriculture have had a sense that there was something wrong, but you know, they're used to working with people who also work for USDA and they're used to the information that they get from them. And every, you know, cycle they're evaluating how well things worked, right? And right. if it doesn't work, you don't blame the cow. It's, you know, the nutritionist or the veterinarian or what have you. So you fix it because your life, you know, life um, income depends on it. Um, it's hard, I think, for people like that to get their minds around just how poor this nutrition science on the human side is compared to what they're basing their livelihoods on in terms of animal health and welfare and, and management. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, the, the question becomes, how do we turn that around? You know, and, and, you know, that's why I always turn the question back to guys like you, you know, is, is there an answer? And if there is an answer to any of it, hmm. how do we get there? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to a soybean farmer and, and I can't even use his name. It's coming up on a Friday show and I'm, I'm recording this guy in two or three days. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, monocropping and how that's killing the planet. You know, we're looking at every other reason, you know, uh, the Green New Deal was talking about cow farts. And, you know, we have people who want to take meat out of schools and, and do all this stuff and- Doing it. Say, say again? They're doing it, not wanting to. It's yeah, being it, done. Yeah, it's getting there. And we're teaching generations and throngs of kids that meat is a bad thing. It's almost like, a you know, it's a black mamba that's going to strike and once it hits you, it's going to kill you. You know, it reminds me of um, uh, my daughter grew up in a world, uh, she's 22 now, uh, but she grew up in Southern California and um, they were taught that not only cigarettes or, you know, cigarettes can kill you, but secondhand smoke can kill you even faster. Mm. Like even if you smell a cigarette, it can, mm. it, it can kill you, right? And I'll, I'll never forget, she was like 14 years old or something, and we were walking down the street somewhere. And I guess someone was smoking in the area, and she, sm she took in a breath, and she was, oh, my God, I got a big gulp of secondhand smoke. Oh, my God, you, Mommy, do you think I'm going to be okay? Do you think she was freaked out by this, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, Tallulah, listen, honey, when I was a kid, 
I would get into a cab of a pickup truck at 4.30 in the morning with three other gentlemen to go rabbit hunting. The windows were rolled up tight because it was freezing cold outside. Two of them were smoking cigarettes and the third one was smoking a cigar. I'm not quite sure how we can see out of the truck, to, you know, and I'm still alive today. Not that that was a good thing and I don't suggest anyone do it, but our generation, everyone smoked and we were always in rooms. You know, if you went to a disco or if you did anything, there was smoking around you, right? People would keep the windows rolled up in cars and smoked. Yet I have a kid who thought secondhand, secondhand smoke outdoors you know, mm -hmm. it's going to kill her. Are we doing the same thing with meat? Are kids going to look at meat the way my daughter looked at secondhand smoke? Yeah. I, uh, before I answer your question, I just make the point that it, when you look at the, the, the rates of, you know, chronic disease lately, the point that gets missed, I think a lot of times is that happened with a dramatic decline in cigarette smoking. Right. Which isn't necessarily reflected in the incidence of a lot of chronic disease. So it's a good thing. I'm all for it. You know, nothing worse than an ex-smoker. And I used to be. So we're, we're all good there. Um, to your point, I think that uh, we've got people who are really, really busy just trying to live their lives. Right. And somebody comes along and tells them, you know, the, you know, do this for this reason, it's compelling and it's easy. So they do it and what have you. Um, if we can get more information out that says what you're being told isn't it, to be charitable, the whole story, right? There, there, there are lots of ways to look at this. And if we can get the message out, I think that as you've said, as I've said, many others, that animal source food is essential for proper human development and function, period, full stop. That we have objective evidence of the harms that come to human beings when they don't get enough. And the only evidence that we have of the harms that come from too much is from the nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease that we were just talking about. In other words, it's very low quality. So with that in mind, then it becomes a, well, can I afford it? You know, how, where do I get it? Maybe I live somewhere with very limited options. What can I do? Right. We need to get back to helping people sort out their choices. There's no one size fits all in any of this. So if we can just broadly help people feel comfortable, if it's part of, you know, your family tradition to eat meat and there are dishes that you ate as part of growing up and grandma, do that. That's that's important beyond the raw nutrition. That right. in addition, I think we need to educate people that talking to human beings about protein is misleading at best. Because the only way you can think that you could get the protein you need from plant source foods is if you don't understand that that's crude protein and we need to be focused on digestible amino acids. And yep. all of these other things, um, the work that Dr. Bickman and others are doing, he's just a name that comes to mind, uh, but with his book, Why We Get Sick, which just recently came out, um, I think he made the case, uh, the point that virtually all chronic disease is at least made worse by hyper in, or insulin resistance, I think is what he called it. Now that can often be accompanied by chronically elevated insulin, but doesn't say that it causes, but it does say it doesn't make it better. So if, if I mean, chronic disease is the biggest killer globally now. Um, and, and this is at a time when, you know, we've got, a quarter of children under five are stunted due to a lack of essential nutrition that's best provided by animal source foods. Uh, a third of women globally are anemic, again, for the same reason. So how do you then align that with people who are saying we should basically be on a macrobiotic diet? Well, um, well you don't. You, the answer is you don't, because it doesn't, it, that's what we're, you know, we've been skirting around this whole time, Peter. You're, you're, 1000% correct. 
you know, we've gone down that road. We've done what they told us to do. And guess what? We're sicker than ever. So it, it will never line up. Mm -hmm. the right. Answer. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, that's, that's exactly right. So, so I think that um, there are people who are trying to work on the policy, you know, kind of top down and I'm all for them and I do whatever I can to help. Um, my thought is that we need to grow this from the bottom up. Um, I think I heard somebody say that a tipping point is not 51%. It's more like 18%. That if we can get that percentage of the population to have shifted, then all sorts of other things accelerate in their chain. I think the, uh, uh, we're likely to see change in marketing, for example, because you know what the market's going to do as soon as it's there, they're going to go for it. And, and they are changing a bit. I, I see products and it's crappy products where they're going, hey, we have one third less sugar and we don't use grains in this product. And if, you know, I, I'm going to go back to something you were asking about in the beginning. And I think it's worthwhile to say here. Um, you, you asked me and I didn't answer the question. <clears throat> um, how did I come up with no sugars, no grains? Um, when I wrote my book, Fitness Confidential, it's been out now for eight years. So that means I wrote it about 10 years ago. Mm. So that I was writing it in 2010. And during the writing of it, I did not want to use the word ketogenic or you know, anything close to ketogenic. And uh, Dean Laurie, who was helping me with the book, uh, said, why are you shy? Why are you staying away from that, from that word? And why won't you put it in your book? And I said, because 80% of the doctors out there think ketogenics is associated with ketoacidosis. Right. And these are medical professionals. And if I put that in my book, I'm going to be looked at as a lunatic and a heretic at best. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not going to use the words. He goes, well, you have to figure out a different way to say it. And we thought about using the word low carb because it really wasn't that out there yet. And I said, look, it's simple. I, I've been telling my clients for years, stay away from sugar, stay away from grains. No sugars, no grains, you'll be fine. But think about that. 10 years ago, I did not want to use the word ketogenic. Now keto is a is just, it, it's it's like saying the Beatles. It's, you yeah. know, it, it's like saying Kleenex or Coke. Yeah, well, you used to be able to smoke on airplanes. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, in my lifetime. Um, so I was recently given the opportunity to speak to an undergraduate class via Zoom. Um, and this is a forages class. So in preparation for it, I kind of realized, you know, there are these um, goals for 2050. You know, they'll say by 2050, we need to increase food production by this amount. We need to increase the supply of animal source protein. They narrow it down. We could talk about that sometime. Um, you know, the, the land that's suitable for that is actually getting less every year due to a number of reasons. Um, there's a couple other things, one of which is that I think that by 2050, something over 75% of the world's population will live in urban areas. Mm. So this, this, this pattern that we saw in, in rural America where people move to the cities, now it's these people's turn in other places to move from subsistence agriculture poverty to areas where they hope to have better economic opportunities. Um, so with all that in mind, that's 2050, that's 30 years from now. Right. So that's their, these, these undergraduates, it's their product, you know, their professional lifetime. Not me, um, <laughs> it's, it's likely not to be me because that's just right. statistics, but if we can find ways, like I say, to build bridges, to get the information available, and given the statistics that are so bad about the rates of obesity, the rates of chronic disease, the lack of metabolic health, optimal metabolic health by almost 90% almost of the population don't, um, by one estimate, uh, adult population don't enjoy optimal metabolic health in the United States. And this is a global phenomenon. If, if 
there are ways for us to get that information to people so that they can make their own changes when they're ready in a way that they then will follow because no diet works that you don't follow. I mean, you've, and it's not a diet, it's lots and lots of other factors. Hopefully then that person influences three that influences three more each. And uh, I'm, I'm old enough to remember the movie in science class in elementary school where they were demonstrating a nuclear re chain reaction where they took mouse traps and they put two ping pong balls on each mousetrap. And so you just had this floor covered with these set mousetraps and somebody got to be the one that just throws the first ping pong ball in there and sets off one and then pretty soon the whole thing just, just disappears. Go go. So I, I, I hope that we can all find ways to work toward that kind of change. Um, and so that would be my answer and my hope. Uh, Peter, I, I think we're getting there. Um, you know, I, I sometimes I just get depressed about the whole thing because, you know, when, when you're, you know, look, I do five podcasts a week. I, I do wow. every show that anyone asks me to come on to. Um, I'm in, you know, people ask me uh, for quotes in their book and I'm always writing for other people's books and on and on and on. I've done two movies. I'm working on a third. And I saw you in a movie, a great movie that's coming out. Um, I wish they would have put more of you in it. I, I think it's called Sacred Cow, but I could yes. be wrong. No, guys, you're right. Everyone you're right. sends me their movies to watch. It's like, you guys realize I'm an idiot. I'm not some curator of great movies, but she did a great movie and um, and kudos. I, I, I'm not remembering her name right now. Diana Dian Rogers. Diana Rogers. Um, Sacred Cow, I think is going to move what you guys are doing ahead a lot because I've wanted to do that type of movie, but I just don't, I don't have that knowledge. But the way that, did you see the movie yet, Peter? I am Peter? trying to watch it. I don't have a DVD player. You know, oh, she could just send you a, um, she could send you a, a copy of it. You're in the movie, just ask her. To yeah, send no, I have a copy. I don't have a DVD player. No, you could just watch it on your computer. Right, there's no disc drive on my notebook. Really? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you need that. You, I just pressed the. There button. may be a link. I'm such I, an idiot. I yeah, there, you sent me a link, and I just watched it. And yeah, um, may, it I'll check. Like, I'll check because I need like, to. It was kind of like the seventies. It was like you need to watch this within twenty four hours, and it's going to self destruct. That like you had. I, so yeah, I sat yeah. there. I said, "Everyone, get out! Get out of my office! I got something to watch." And she did such a great job because they show how. You know, they showed the guy here where, near where I live, the Polyface Farm guy mm -hmm. and all these different people and how they're doing renewable land, you know, and mm -hmm. they're moving the cattle and the sheep and everything else. And, yeah. and I'm like, this is what Peter talks about every time he comes to my show. I just have no way of showing this. And that's what she does in this movie. I, I think yeah. she does an incredible job. Good, good. I mean, these are, these are things that I've been aware of for decades these are yeah. things that I was taught about by, you know, my professors who were taught about by their professors. There's some technology that's come along to help us in management. But um, so it's, I've, I've said to people within the forage agriculture space that we have the best story going. Yeah. We can have healthy people and healthy soils and sustainable societies, all thanks to ruminant animal agriculture. And we get to eat ribeyes. Deal. <laughs> it's a win-win. You know, and, and look, I'm going crazy right now. I'm in central Virginia and I'm seeing deer dead all over the road again. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and you know that, that people forget that that's a ruminant, right? I mean, that's mm -hmm. a ruminant. Yeah, that's yes, a, yes, it is. Yes. And uh, I, I said to Serena, we were driving uh, up north last uh, weekend. And we saw three on the way there and two on the way back. And I said, that's it. I'm taking at least one deer this year. I, I quit hunting a few years ago. I still shoot. Um, I'm, I'm a skeet shooter and competitive and all that. Mm -hmm. But I said, yeah, that's it. Do we have room in the big freezer? And she said, yes. I said, I'm taking mm -hmm. one deer this year. You know, why let all these animals just die on mm -hmm. the road when you, can, yeah. when you can eat them, you can consume them? Well, and if we don't manage the herds then they decline in health and vigor. They overpopulate. Um, what region of uh, the state did you move to? 
I'm, I'm in central Virginia. I'm near Charlottesville. Okay. Okay. Cause I, um, there's, there's some people that, um, I work with that might be quite interested to, to, to know that you're in the neighborhood. So, uh, okay. I'll reach Please, out to I, them. No. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're, we're coming up on the hour, which is the time that you were kind enough to share. I really appreciate it. Um, it's always great to talk with you. Um, thank you for all you continue to do. Looking forward to FAT2 and um, that's not T-O-O. -O. Um, not anymore. <laughs> um, so any last words before we say goodbye to each other? My last words are kudos to you for starting this podcast. Um, I'm not sure that there's many people in your position. I know there's you, there's Dr. Savory, there's a few other people, but I think this is the first of its kind, right? And if not the first of its kind, it, like, like I always say, if you're not in a class by yourself, Peter, it doesn't take long to call roles. So congratulations on getting this podcast started. And I've loved this show so much. I'm trying to figure out how I can share this show on my platform and then send people back to you. I'm, I, if you want to do that, we need to talk to my people because this might be one of the best conversations I think we've ever had. Hmm. Um, so I think we need to figure out how to cross share this. That would be great. Have to see this. That would be awesome. So people can find you on the web at vinnytortorich.com, Vinny with an I E, V I N N I E, T is in Tom, O R, T O R again, I C H. If you just put in Vinny T, somehow I populate on Google now because of the movie and the book and everything mm -hmm. else. So um, you'll find me and then you can go look around. Everything I put out there is mostly free. You have to pay for the movie. You have to pay for my book, but you don't need that to be healthy. You can just go. I have a free PDF on VinnyTotteridge.com and it's there for people not to have to pay for good health. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the next time that we can sit down at a Brazilian steakhouse and make them cry. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, I wish you all the best with, with all the changes coming up in, in your situation, your life. And uh, um, yeah, who knows? I might actually get to travel again and get That's out nice. to that part of the world. So um, with all that, I wish everyone good health until the next time.